Rafael Paz, who is a professor at Cornell Tech. Um, Rafa is an expert in cryptography and has uh, uh, done many excellent contributions to the field of uh, theoretical cryptography and this interplay with complexity and especially game theory. Um, recently, recently, Rafael has uh, also started uh, working on blockchain and he has made uh, many contributions there. And uh, today he's going to talk about some of these. Um, so the title of the talk is Spark, Succinct Paralyzable Argument of Knowledge. And I'll let Rafael uh, take the stage from here. Thank you. Thank you so much, Claudio, for the very kind introduction. And uh, thank you so much for the organizer for inviting me. So as you heard, I'm going to talk about the sparks or succinct paralyzable arguments of knowledge. And this is a joint work with uh, Nomi, Cody, and Ilan. So before talking about uh, sparks, let me start by just telling you a little bit about just succinct arguments of knowledge, or even just succinct uh, arguments. So as you probably all know, succinct arguments are one, or at least what I think, uh, are one of the uh, central contributions of uh, uh, computer science to, uh, to blockchains, but also to uh, just the world and philosophy in general. It's just, it's just such, such a fascinating concept. Uh, it's a concept that originated with uh, the notion of interactive proof defined by Golos and Michaeli and Rakoff, uh, continued through the notion of a probabilistically checkable proof, PCPs, and, uh, and the, the final notion of succinct argument was formalized by Kilian and Michaeli in the early 90s. So what is a succinct argument? So let's say a, uh, I would like to prove to you that a statement X is true. So uh, to formalize this, we consider some statement um, X in some uh, language that is an NP. And it's very easy for me to prove that this statement is true by just giving you uh, the witness, and then you can uh, look at the witness and check that this uh, statement indeed is true. But sometimes checking uh, that the statement is true, even if you have the witness, could actually take a pretty long time. So the succinct argument, we, what we want is to have a prover convinced to verify that the statement is true, uh, but doing so much more efficiently than the time it takes to just verify uh, the validity. So to formalize this, we have a prover, P, that uh, takes uh, the statement X and the witness's input, and the verifier V. And uh, what we require here are um, a few standard properties. The first one is completeness, which is that if X indeed is true, then the verifier should accept. Soundness says that if X isn't true, in that case, uh, the verifier should not accept. So to formalize this, what we uh, actually say is that no probabilistic polynomial time cheating prover can convince the verifier. Often we'll also consider a slightly stronger notion of soundness, which is called an argument of knowledge property. And this property says that if the prover managed to convince the verifier, then not only the trace statement should be true, but the prover actually has a witness, knows a witness uh, to the statement. Now, the crucial novel aspect in a succinct argument is the efficiency property. And that property says that the verifier should run very fast. In particular, it should run in time poly log t, where t is the time needed to verify uh, the statement. Now, uh, since the verifier runs in pollogarithmic time, that directly also implies that uh, the communication complexity is also uh, very small, uh, i.e. succinct. So the communication is also going to be a uh, polylogarithmic in T. So this is all great. What we're going to focus on today is the overhead needed from the prover in order to complete this proof. And the standard definition in a succinct argument just says that the prover's running time should be poly polynomial in T. So, from a theoretical point of view, that means that prover is efficient. It runs in polynomial time in the time t needed to verify the statement. So that's uh, great. But uh, if you actually want to implement these things, that overhead in the prover uh, complexity could actually be pretty uh, prohibitive. In particular, let's look at uh, uh, probably the most famous example for 16th arguments, which is that of uh, secure uh, delegation or secure outsourcing of computation. 
So let's say I have this little laptop, that's my laptop, and uh, I would like to delegate the computation of some um, very expensive program M uh, to the cloud. So I provide the program M and some inputs to the cloud, to AWS. AWS performs this computation for me. And let's say this is a computation that takes a pretty long time. How can I know that the answer to the computation that AWS provided is correct? So through a succinct argument, I could simply ask the cloud to also uh, provide a proof that indeed Y is the output of this program input X. Okay, so this leads to this very uh, elegant compute then proof uh, paradigm. So I give the program to the cloud, the cloud uh, computes the program and then provides a proof that indeed the output is correct. And then I don't have to trust the cloud anymore. So in order for this proof to be uh, meaningful to me, having a small laptop, we require this proof to be succinct. It should be basically independent of the running time of the, uh, of the program, because if the proof is huge, then of course, you know, even just reading it, I, I could have just computed myself. Now, in order for this application to make sense, in real life, it's important that AWS overhead here isn't too high in computing proof. For instance, if the proof overhead is, let's say, T squared, then it turns out that this whole paradigm that looks so great becomes useless in practice, because a computation that would just on its own take one hour would now take four million years uh, to uh, compute the proof of. So in order for this paradigm to make sense, uh, in practice, we really require that the, the running time of the prover to be uh, pretty small, also pretty close to uh, the time T. Let me also point out, since this is a, a blockchain workshop, uh, these type of uh, delegation applications are um, very important in lots of different uh, blockchain applications, starting with uh, uh, applications in uh, Zcash for uh, getting privacy preserving uh, cryptocurrencies, uh, and now more recently to just prove the correctness of um, various different uh, smart contracts. So if the smart contract takes a, a pretty long time to, uh, to evaluate, it would be ideal to uh, just post the, the answer uh, to, uh, to some long computation uh, on the blockchain and a proof that it was done. And then nobody has to re, uh, recompute this uh, whole uh, smart contract. We can just check the, the, the succinct proof of the validity of this uh, computation. All right, so what is the state of the art in terms of proof of efficiency? Because that's gonna be the, the focus of this talk. So it turns out that actually, from a theoretical point of view, uh, it's basically uh, solved the question. And it turns out that we have these uh, solutions that are quasi-optimal, meaning that uh, the prover's running time is t times polylog t. So t would be completely optimal, right? t is the time needed to compute this, uh, this program. And so here we just have an overhead that's multiplicative of polylog t. And in fact, this follows uh, quite easily by relying on uh, the most state-of-the-art uh, constructions of, of PCPs. I won't go into detail too on uh, what PCPs are, uh, but it really won't be necessary for the remainder of the talk. And combining that with uh, Killian's uh, original approach to uh, getting uh, succinct arguments. So that looks pretty great. But sometimes even this polylog T overhead is pretty prohibitive. And if we'd like to minimize this, and indeed in recent years, there has been a flood of work trying to get down this polylog to be as small as possible. And so uh, there are so many works, it's not even, I can't even put them on, uh, on one slide. It's really in this last decade, uh, an abundance of work trying to shave down uh, polylog factors and shaving down constants to making it uh, making this overhead as small as possible. But if we're gonna rely on this approach, which is indeed what most uh, of the uh, works in the literature do, a major open problem uh, on uh, even just with PCPs is to get PCPs with just constant overhead is still unknown. Thus PCPs require uh, logarithmic uh, overhead. 
So it seems that we kind of hit a wall here. Uh, there's a lot of work uh, trying to like improve, and, and these are very, very important works, and we'll get back to uh, why even shaving off a constant or log factors here uh, is important. But his whole general paradigm seems to be stuck even at getting, seems very hard to get something which is constant overhead. Now, I would argue that sometimes even just a factor two overhead is too much. Right? And at the moment, I'm saying we don't even know how to get a constant overhead, but two, even 2t two is sometimes too much. And uh, so the question is, can we get something this good, even just a factor two, or even better? Okay, now I'll get back to why sometimes even 2t is too much. And indeed, there has been this very nice approach uh, relying on something called parallelizable PCPs that shows that actually you can get just basically T plus some polylog T overhead. So not even factor two, just some slightly small uh, uh, overhead if you have a lot of parallelism. So in particular, this very nice work uh, from uh, by Benson et al. from 2013 showed that, uh, showed that if, I give you T parallel processors to the prover. So if the prover has lots and lots of parallel processors, indeed it's going to actually compute this proof basically in, uh, uh, with just a small polylogarithmic overhead, additive overhead. So note here it's T plus polylog T as opposed to T times polylog T. But the problem with this approach is that uh, now you require lots and lots and lots of parallel processors. So you require as much parallelism as the running time of the, the computation. And I won't go into detail on this, but it relies on this notion of a parallelizer PCP, a PCP that can be computed, uh, where each bit of the PCP can be computed in uh, small parallel time. All right, so summarizing the, uh, uh, the state of art, let me, oh, sorry, before I do that, let me just mention that I'm currently here and throughout the whole presentation, I'm going to ignore the security parameter uh, uh, in all these expressions. So actually, when I write t times polylog t, it's actually t times polylog t uh, times security parameter or some polynomial security parameter. So t, I consider that as being something that's pretty big. I t think of that as some uh, some large time, and we want to, uh, uh, we're considering proofs that are independent of uh, that want to be essentially independent of the running time but they will depend on security parameter. All right, so summarizing the state of the art, and again, I'm ignoring security parameters here. The original uh, six int arguments, they uh, relied on a few parallel processors. In fact, one was enough, uh, but they had some arbitrary polynomial overhead in terms of um, prover running time. The later ones, uh, and, and all the more modern ones starting from 2005, they have quasi-linear uh, complexity. So that means that the prover's running time is T times polylog T. And then this uh, approach from the 2013 paper shows that actually you can basically have no overhead uh, in, uh, uh, in the running time but at the price of using a linear number of parallel processors. So obviously the open problem here is to get something uh, that is in this regime. And that's going to be what we call sparks. So sparks are uh, succinct uh, arguments that have basically no overhead in terms of running time and use a small number of parallel processors. So let me now formalize this notion. So the key idea behind sparks here will be to compute the proof in parallel to the computation. So think of this running example of outsourcing something to, to uh, AWS, to the cloud. You send the program, the cloud is going to compute the program, and at the same time that it's computing the program, in parallel, actually compute the proof. Right? So in a little bit more detail, it's going to be a succinct argument where the prover computes both the program here and the proof 
using time t plus polylog t. All right, note that it's actually to achieve this, it's not going to be okay to first compute the program and then compute a proof uh, based on just the answer, because if you just have the answer, you, you need to have some extra kind of information to compute the proof. So it's going to be crucial that we actually compute the program and at the same time compute the proof. And now in contrast to this 2013 paper is we're going to only uh, allow you to have polylog T processors, parallel processors. So there will be some overhead in the, in the prover. And in, ter in terms of total work, we're actually not beating uh, the previous work. It's still going to be T times polylog T total work. But what we have done here is we pushed all the extra work into parallelism. So the running time is still essentially just T, but all the extra work is pushed into parallelism. Okay. Any questions on this notion? All right, so a little bit more formally, it turns out that even to f define this notion, you have to be a little bit uh, careful because as we said, uh, as we said, in, in order to, to achieve this, it's important that the, the, the computation is done in parallel with the, uh, the proof. So if we want to formalize this as an MP statement that we're going to prove, we have a program M, uh, an input uh, X, some running time T, and some um, output Y. And we have some witness W that certifies that uh, this program M on input uh, X outputs Y. Now, Typically, when we define interactive proofs, we're giving the prover and the verifier the whole statement that we want to prove. But here, what we want is for the prover to compute the program and at the same time the proof. So we're actually going to consider a scenario where the prover doesn't get the whole statement, in particular, doesn't get Y. But instead, the prover only gets M, X, T and needs to compute Y uh, and convince the verifier uh, of this and at the same time, send Y2 to, to the verifier. So it's kind of, we have this delayed uh, output. So Y is not known in advance. P and V only receive M, X, and T as input. And this is because we have this super tight requirement that uh, we want you to, you know, even just a factor two is too much. So computing it first and then computing the proof, that would already give you uh, a factor two overhead. And so we don't want that. That's why we say, I'm only giving you M, X, and T, not the output. You compute it, and at the same time, give me the proof. Okay, I'm not going to go over uh, these things very formally, but the completeness and, and sameness properties are uh, are basically as before. So completeness says that uh, on input M, X, and T, the verifier eventually is going to output uh, the output of the program Y. Uh, and the sum is properly, we're going to formulate as, as an argument of knowledge properly, saying that if indeed V outputs Y, then P must know a witness, W, such that uh, this statement is true. And efficiency, as we said before, the prover runs in parallel time T plus polylog T using polylog T processors. And again, uh, um, I'm ignoring here um, uh, the security parameters. Actually, it's, uh, we have a, an extra security parameter here. And, and as before, as the standard properties of sixth arguments, the verifies running time should be polylog T, and the communication therefore is polylog T. Is this all clear? All right, so now I've introduced this notion of a succinct um, or, or a spark, a succinct parallelized argument, uh, argument of knowledge. Now the question is, what can we achieve? And our main result is that assuming the existence of collision resistant hash functions, there exists a four-run spark for uh, all of MP. So we can actually prove all of MP with essentially no overhead in, in prover running time. And the only overhead is, uh, has been pushed into parallelism. Uh, we can also prove a non-interactive version of this. So uh, if we assume the existence of collisions and hash functions, and uh, a so-called quasi-linear snark. I'll get back to that, uh, come back to what that is shortly. Uh, there exists a non-interactive spark. 
let me just mention that uh, all standard uh, or all state of our SNARKs satisfy this quasi-linear uh, efficiency property, and therefore we can uh, get non-interactive sparks based on the same assumptions uh, as we have in SNARKs today. And the way both of these two results are proven is actually through a general transformation. And the way this transformation works is we start off with uh, any succinct argument that satisfies this quasi-linear uh, efficiency property. So quasi-linear efficiency just means that the, um, that the prover efficiency is T times polylog T. So if you recall that uh, state of our picture, uh, the, actually, let me get back to the picture. This is, these uh, all more recent works, the work starting from 2005, have causally improved efficiency. So start off with any one of, uh, of these most recent uh, succinct arguments and plug them into our transformation and what you get out will be uh, a spark. Okay. So one way to think about this transformation is what we're showing is, is a method for tra trading off time for many processors. So these previous works had time t times pol log t. So the total work is t times pol log t. We will have the same amount of total work, or actually a little bit more even, but asymptotically it's t times pol log t. But the running time is going to be essentially t. So the time is t, but all that extra work has now been pushed into parallelism. So in particular, if we plug in uh, Killian's arguments with the uh, Benson Sudan PCP, we get uh, a spark, a forehand, the forehand, and if we instead start with a causal linear snark, we're going to get non interactive sparks. So, the focus of my talk will just uh, actually going to be on this uh, uh, interactive setting. I'm not going to talk much about the, these ones, and I'm going to try to show you uh, how to get a causal linear. 16th argument and turn it into, into a spark. Okay. But before doing that, <clears throat> let me briefly mention some applications of sparks. I mentioned in some applications, even a factor two overhead uh, improver efficiency is too much. So uh, let's see how we can uh, use sparks in such applications. So the first application is uh, actually the, the original running example I had which is delegation. So in the case of delegation, let's say that you're outsourcing some complicated uh, computation uh, that uh, you're doing some um, drug discovery, let's say, and you have some competitors. They're also doing their own uh, drug discovery. Now, if you, and you just don't want to buy all the computers, you prefer to outsource this, this computation to, to a cloud, uh, because uh, potentially for AWS, computing power is actually uh, a lot cheaper because they have uh, economies of scale and so on and so forth. Now, if uh, this computation, let's say, takes two years to run, and then computing the proof has an overhead of a factor 10, even just a factor 10, then now suddenly that's something that's going to require 20 years uh, to get back the proof of. Now it becomes useless for you. Right, because your competitors maybe are willing to buy the computing power and just run it on their own, and now you lost all your um, the advantages you had. So even in the case of just outsourcing computation, uh, it turns out that you know even a factor two overhead could be could be uh, too much. However, with a Spark, we can now just send m of x m and x to the cloud. The cloud computes m of x equals y, so it gives back y to you and at the same time computes this spark, uh, and, uh, and you get back the answer within time uh, t plus uh, polylog t. So if you have access to a spark, you can now get delegation with optimal approval runtime. Now, again, of course, AWS will have some overhead in terms of parallelism, but they have lots of computers anyway. So you might have to pay a higher price because uh, to, to get the proof, but uh, maybe that, that trade-off in, um, in prices anyway, uh, maybe it would have been even more expensive for you to actually set up this infrastructure uh, in-house. So maybe you're willing to pay an extra 
uh, a premium in terms of um, of the price, but you're not going to pay a premium in terms of running time. So as a corollary, what we get is directly assuming collisions and hash functions uh, and uh, a quasi-linear snark, you can get a time type delegation scheme where this is just a single message. And if you're willing with, uh, to go for interaction, which is fine, just CRH suffice. Another application is to uh, so-called verifiable uh, delay functions or VDFs. This is a fascinating concept that was introduced a few years ago by Bonnet et al. and has had lots uh, of uh, awesome applications to, uh, to blockchains. So to define this notion, let me first recall the notion of a sequential function. So a sequential function is a function or a T sequential function is roughly speaking a function that can be computed in time t, but it can actually not be sped up. So it cannot be computed in time t times uh, one minus epsilon t. So t times one minus epsilon. Right? So it, it's something that takes a long time to compute, but it can actually not be sped up. There are no shortcuts. So the canonical example of this is repeated squaring, modular composite, and uh, uh, unless you know the factorization. So sequential functions uh, are great. These are so-called delay functions. But an issue with a sequential function is that if you have computed it, uh, nobody can actually check that the answer uh, is correct. Right? So the only way to check the answer is correct is to recompute it, which takes a long time. The notion of verifiable delay function overcomes this uh, second obstacle. Roughly speaking, a VDF is a sequential function that additionally Consist, contains a proof of the output, uh, of the correctness of the output. So once you computer it, you not only uh, manage to compute the output, but you also uh, have computer a proof that the output is correct. So at first you might think, look, VDFs are trivial. Just take a sequential function and combine it with a, a succinct uh, uh, non-interactive argument, a snark, right? And just apply your sequential function and then combine it with your proof. The problem with this is if the proof has some overhead, then when you combine these two things, it actually takes a lot longer to compute the function and, uh, and the proof. Uh, and now an attacker, so an attacker, however, might actually come up with a, you know, compute the output much faster by simply ignoring the, uh, the proof. However, if we have a spark, then this naive transformation actually works. You can just take a sequential function, combine it with a non-interactive spark, and that directly gives you a VDF because there is no, you can actually, with a spark, a spark allows you to compute this and the proof in time, just uh, time t. So that gives you directly uh, a VDF and uh, the proof of this is in the paper. So, uh, let me mention that the previous, the previous general construction of VDFs, there are now lots of very nice constructions of VDFs based on concrete assumptions. But if you want to, uh, something based on general assumptions, the best previous construction started off with something called an iterated sequential function. So an iterated sequential function is something like repeated squaring. It's a function that you keep iterating. Uh, and we're assuming that the iteration of this function cannot be shortcut. That's one way one type of candidate construction of a sequential function, but not all sequential functions necessarily have this iterated nature. So previously, starting with iterated sequential functions and snarks, one could get VDFs, uh, but we cannot start off with any sequential function. And this actually has uh, an important advantage because some sequential functions actually are not iterated by design. Uh, there are these so-called memory-hard sequential functions. And these are sequential functions that not only require some running time, but require to also have a lot of memory. Turns out that actually uh, our transformation doesn't really care at all about any properties of sequential function. If the sequential function is memory-hard, then actually uh, what we get after our present transformation is going to be a memory-hard uh, sequential function that is verifiable also. Uh, so using a spark and starting off with 
some general sequential functions, or for instance, a memory hot sequential function. Uh, and indeed, in fact, in, in recent years, there's also been an explosion of works trying to uh, study various different uh, memory hard sequential functions. It turns out that there are many uh, subtle, uh, um, many subtleties in even how to define memory hardness. Uh, I'll refer you to the paper uh, where we uh, where we actually don't discuss in so much detail, but we, we reference some of these uh, early recent works that discuss uh, some of the uh, subtleties in, in defined memory hardness. There are lots of different uh, very nice notions on this and some very recent uh, nice uh, constructions. So take any of those uh, candidate constructions of sequential or memory hard sequential functions, combine it with a spark, and you now get a candidate construction of memory hard verifiable Tillane function. And, uh, and let me point out that uh, VDS have had a, a lot of uh, very nice applications to blockchains, and um, there have been these suggested uh, recent um, uh, applications of using uh, also these memory hard functions in order to get more ASIC resistance. So by you know by using the sparks, one could get these memory hard VDFs, and you can kind of get the best of uh, both worlds. And uh, so, as far as I know. Well, because before this work, we didn't have any candidate constructions on memory hard VDFs. Uh, there haven't been any applications of this formalized, but uh, I will leave that to future work. All right. So uh, for the remainder of the uh, the talk, I'm planning to give you a very brief overview of uh, this construction of a quasi-linear uh, of how we can take uh, a succinct argument and turn it into a spark, assuming uh, the existence of collisions and hash functions. And for now, I'm going to make a, a bunch of simplifying assumptions. Uh, the first one is that we're going to assume for simplicity that actually we have access to uh, a non-interactive uh, succinct uh, argument of knowledge. Uh, and uh, additionally, I'm going to assume that original program that the proof is proving something about is a sequential RAM computation. So the original program M is a sequential algorithm. It's not a parallel algorithm. OK. Uh, and as a warm up, let's actually consider an even simplified, even more simplified scenario. Uh, and that's a scenario where we have a program that uses a very small amount of space. OK. And this idea uh, actually. Uh, originated or is implicit in uh, some uh, very nice uh, works from a few years ago uh, on uh, on VDFs. And here in this warm up, we're going to show how to use this idea to to get sparks for small space computations. Okay. So remember, in a spark, we need to compute some program M on input X and some witness W, uh, producing some output Y. And at the same time, we need to produce this proof. OK, so let's again make another simplifying assumption. Let's assume that uh, we don't have a, a, a snark with causal linear efficiency, but in fact, we have something that's pretty great that has a factor two uh, extra overhead. So the proof just so this computing this takes time t and computing the proof takes time t. OK, as far as I know, we don't know how to do this, even for even very simple computations. But let's assume we have this for now. And let's see how we can use this in order to get a spark. So the proof takes as long to compute as the um, as the actual computation. All right. So since remember we need to complete within t steps both the computation and the proof. So what can we do? Well, basically start running a program. After t over two steps, stop it, and then start computing the proof. That's going to now complete after t steps. So, so now what we have is a way to compute in time t uh, a proof of correctness of the computation after t over two steps. So that's not great because we need to look at the output after t steps, but at least we've made some progress. We say, okay, after t steps, we can at least compute something about the, uh, uh, the memory uh, content of the computation after t over two steps. Okay. But, now, once I'm computing this proof, why don't I start running, continuing running the program? So just comp 
recursively compute and prove the rest in parallel. So what I mean by this, while you compute this proof, which is a proof about this thing, continue running the program. You have parallelism, right? So continue running the program for t over four steps and provide a proof of those t over four steps. And then once you've done that, continue running it for t over eight steps, compute the proof and so on and so forth. And eventually you get something that's just so small that you can just uh, verify by hand. So what happened here? Well, it turns out that you only need log t of these threads and this log t of these proofs to actually provide the proof for the whole computation. So now we do have a log t uh, increase for prover and verifier in uh, communication complexity, but this overhead uh, is all done in parallel. And in fact, the running time is just t. Furthermore, there was actually nothing magical about uh, this number two here. Uh, if the proof had a factor 10 overhead, then we could have just started off by computing 10 over t over 10 steps and let the proof be computed. And we could have just done the same thing. And uh, that would have still actually given you uh, roughly, uh, actually we'll give it 10 log t um, uh, parallel threads. And more generally, if the overhead is eight times t, then you're still gonna get uh, roughly eight times log t uh, parallel threads, and this gives you uh, something that only has now uh, polylog T overhead in uh, in parallelism. All right, so this is uh, a, was a very simple approach when the amount of space is small, but the problem here is, you know, what are we actually proving here? What is this a proof? Well, what I'm proving here is starting the program from this point and going to this point. And what does a point mean? A point means a certain memory configuration. So going from this zero memory configuration to some memory configuration I'm here, uh, I'm proving that is correct. And then here I'm proving that starting from that memory configuration, uh, running for t with four steps leads me to this memory configuration. So if you look at these proofs, they actually grow with the, uh, with the, the size of the memory. So really what we're proving here is some starting points configuration leads to some uh, uh, end configuration within uh, T steps. And if you just do this naively, uh, the, the statement uh, and therefore the, the complexity of this proof grows with the, the size of the, um, of the statement and that is the, the space of the computation. So when you have computations that use a lot of space, this just doesn't work. So uh, the naive attempt here would be to, okay, uh, why prove something about the whole memory? We know we should use hash functions. Let's just hash down uh, the space and uh, let the prover prove that, in fact, the statement now is going to be, uh, here's a hash down state, here's another hash down state, uh, taking k steps takes me from here, from this hash to this hash, from this digest to this digest. Now the statement is small. The problem here is if you look at the witness, the witness to this is actually the whole uh, memory. So the witness is still big. So this uh, up approach actually uh, doesn't quite uh, work either. Okay. So what we're gonna rely on <clears throat> is the idea here that actually, uh, if we use a nice hash function, in particular, uh, uh, um, uh, a Merkle tree hash function, as is well known, these uh, Merkle tree hashes have this nice property that they're updatable. I can very give you a short certificate that I have just done a certain number of uh, uh, updates uh, into the memory and the updates, uh, the size of the updates are just grows polylogarithmically with the, the size of the database. Okay. So in essence, we're going to use the same approach with uh, digest one to digest two from start to final. And the prover is going to prove that we've done a certain number of uh, updates into memory, k updates if, the, if you're running program for k steps. And these updates, they, they're really, they are verifiable. So this is just, it's a memory access 
and a proof, an authentication pass that shows you that in fact, I did uh, only get minor change, this particular one change uh, into the memory. So now that seems uh, very easy. Why don't I just, you know, provide this proof? This proof now only grows with the number of updates. Uh, so it's uh, so the witness is short, the statement is short, all great. The problem here is how do I compute all these updates uh, at the same time as the computation? Right, so that is now the, the, the main obstacle that I need to be able to update this Merkle tree um, in parallel with the computation. And if you look at how updates are done in a Merkle team naively, they actually require doing log and sequential steps. So it seems like we're kind of dead already. However, what we'll show is that actually we can, in essence, pipeline the, these updates to the Merkle tree and do them all in this pipeline parallel fashion. So even though it actually is going to take log and steps, the log is only going to be something additive towards the end. So many of these steps can be done kind of in a pipeline fashion. So they do take log and time, but it's done pipelines. So eventually you're going to only get an additive overhead of, uh, of login. So I'm kind of uh, running out of time. So let me uh, go over this uh, kind of fast and on a very high level. So recall uh, in a Merkle tree, we have some uh, database uh, to hash it down. I'm going to take uh, two elements here, hash those, uh, hash those, uh, and eventually I get uh, uh, the root here in the digest. Whenever I would like to make an update to a position, uh, let's say here, then uh, I'm going to uh, present you with the, the root, uh, sorry, with the path from this position down to the root, as well as this uh, authentication uh, path, which are the siblings of all the uh, elements that I'm touching. So to, to certify that, that uh, this thing has been uh, updated correctly, I'm also providing you with a sibling and so on and so forth. Okay. I assume many of you have actually seen this uh, Merkle trees and how Merkle trees can be updated locally. So uh, I'm admittedly doing this uh, very fast. Now, so, so let's say I'm updating this position. I need to present you with this and also all these threads. These are these uh, authentication uh, notes, leaves that allows you to check that indeed I'm, I'm updating this uh, digest correctly. So here is uh, the key observation, which turns out to actually be a very simple uh, uh, observation. Uh, it's almost surprising it wasn't uh, made before. So it turns out that Merkle trees are amazing. They are actually uh, what we refer to as concurrently updatable. They're not just updatable, but they're also concurrently updatable. So that means that I can actually do many updates to them uh, um, with essentially no uh, no uh, multiplicative overhead in terms of running time. So let's say I would like to make the, uh, a write operation here. So I'm going to do some updates uh, to this. I need to also read this in order to uh, to compute uh, this node here. So I do that. That's uh, in position in step one. Then uh, in step two, I need to read this extra thing here in order to update uh, the next nodes, the ancestors. At the same time that I'm doing this, that I'm doing the second step here, I can start accessing some, something else and start working on that and start hashing these two things to get that. Okay. When I do that, I can now go back and do the third thing. And the third thing can actually be the same one as here. And the key point here is that when I'm reading these two things, the updates that I'm doing for uh, for, for things that happened here before, they're already kind of higher up in the wave. So all these updates, you can think of them as little waves coming. And even if I start updating something behind here, that wave is never gonna catch up to this one. So that's why there will be no interference and I can actually do all these things in, uh, in parallel. Um, and it's only the last final update that will require some extra uh, uh, login steps. So the conclusion here with this Merkle trees, you can actually compute these K updates in parallel with the whole computation. Uh, and uh, in a paper, we formalize this as a property, uh, as, a, as a new primitive called a concurrently updatable um, hash tree. And 
let's now see how we can use this <clears throat> on a high level, these concurrently updatable uh, hash trees or Merkle trees with concurrent updates uh, to, um, to get a spark. All right, so we'd like to get a spark for some computation takes time t. So we start by uh, initializing an empty uh, database and gets the digest zero. <clears throat> then we're gonna do some K1 steps of computation. And in parallel to those steps of computation, we're gonna actually compute these updates to the Merkle tree. And remember, they can be done in this like uh, parallel fashion with these waves they are not touching each other. There will be some extra, uh, extra time spent here, uh, things hang out uh, for uh, the final operations. That's some extra uh, log t time. Once we have computed this thing, we can now provide a, a, a proof that this digest created the digest at the end of this using these updates. That's the new witness for the uh, for the proof, and that has some overhead. Let's say factor two. In parallel, at this point, when this is done, we can now start doing some other K2 steps and some other updates. And once those updates are done, we can provide a proof. And so on and so forth. Uh, and if you continue in this fashion, it turns out that if the overhead, if you start off with a, a quasi-linear snark or succinct argument, then you uh, will only need uh, M, which is polylog T parallel threads. And this will all complete in time t plus this extra little overhang, which is polylog t. Rafael, we are running out of time. OK, so I will uh, quickly uh, wrap up here. So, uh, so to conclude, uh, all of this finishes in parallel time t plus polylog t. And the, the, the spark complexity is m times the, the complexity of the underlying snark. So there is some extra overhead in terms of parallelism from the underlying snark, but it's only uh, polylog t. t. Uh, proving uh, the security of this thing turns out to actually be a little bit tricky. I won't go into detail on that. Uh, the issue here is that uh, we have lots of different snarks uh, that all have lots of these uh, arguments of knowledge. You need to run a with uh, arguments of knowledge extractor from each one of them, since you're running many of them in parallel. Uh, this leads to problems with the composition. Uh, it is dealt with in the paper. Um, this actually requires coming up with some uh, new definitions of proofs of knowledge that compose nicely uh, that I think uh, are of independent interest. Uh, I won't really go into the detail on the interactive case now because I'm running out of time. Uh, when it's interactive, <clears throat> if you do things naively, you can also uh, get a blow up in terms of a uh, uh, number of rounds in the protocol. Uh, However, if you rely on some specific uh, instantiations of interactive um, of interactive um, succinct arguments, you can actually sync up messages in a clever way in order to get uh, this uh, foreign protocol. I won't go into detail. So to summarize, uh, Sparks uh, are these, uh, what we think of as a new parallel where we're computing the proof, not uh, after the computation, but in fact in parallel with computation. Uh, and that allows us to get proofs that can be computed Together with the, the uh, with the actual computation, with just some uh, very small additive overheads. Uh, however, uh, we do need polylogarithmic many processors. So so far, everything I told you about here only dealt with sequential programs M. Uh, ideally, we would of course also would like to deal with programs M that already use parallelism. Right. When I want to outsource a computation to the Amazon, most computations today actually severely uh, leverage parallelism. And uh, so if you use the approach that I just showed you here, that requires first transforming your program to a sequential program and then uh, providing a proof a spark for that. And that already would impose huge overhead. Uh, in the actual paper, uh, we do uh, deal with also sparks for PRAMs. So again, I won't go into detail, but uh, what we can achieve is if you already use P parallel processors, I'm going to uh, be able to do the computation in the same time T plus polylog TP. TP is the, the total amount of work. T is the time. P is the processors. Uh, using P times polylog T processors. So again, as before, we have an overhead now uh, of polylog T in terms of, in terms of number of processors. Uh, but we're preserving the time. Uh, 
All right, details are in the paper. So to conclude, we introduced this notion of a spark that allows you to uh, compute and prove uh, uh, any statement in, in MP, in fact, any non-deterministic PRAM in time uh, T plus pol log T uh, with just an overhead of pol log T in terms of number of processors. And we did it through uh, providing this generic transformation from succinct arguments uh, that satisfy quasi-linear efficiency to, uh, to sparks. And we also presented some applications of, uh, uh, of these to uh, delegation and uh, verifiable delay functions. In particular, this gives the first construction of a member hard VDF. I should end with this very important caveat. This is just a theoretical feasibility result. Uh, there's lots and lots of work uh, required to, to make it practical. Uh, in fact, let me just briefly mention uh, uh, some things. So one, uh, one thing this uh, really uh, tells us to focus on is that actually uh, focusing on, on improving the, the constants uh, uh, of just uh, succinct arguments with polylocal logarithmic overhead is crucial because in our transformation, that overhead actually turned, got tr uh, transferred into parallelism. So if you'd like to minimize parallelism, we'd like to really understand how much minimize the total amount of work. Uh, there are some other um, more theoretical problems and some other more uh, practical. I'm running out of time here, so I'm not going to uh, really go over them. But I, I think that maybe, the, to me, the, the, the key uh, open problem from a practical point of view is to, to implement this paradigm uh, and potentially implement it using some uh, better specific updatable hash functions, maybe using some algebraic um, uh, hash functions that will compose nicely with snarks. Uh, in order to get a, a more streamlined implementation of this. So I'll end with this. Thank you so much. And sorry Thank for running out of time. Uh, so we are already quite uh, uh, behind schedule. So I suggest that, so we have a, a break schedule now. Um, I suggest we start the next talk at five past six and I'm sure that Rafael is happy to take some questions during the break. Um, Sounds good. Yes, so there is a question in the uh, 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 chat. Christian asks, could methods like this perhaps be using system like Arbitrum? Um, so what is Arbitrum? Tell me, I actually don't see the chat. Can I see the chat? Uh, or should I stop sharing? It's hard to see the chat while you see everything else. Um, Let's see if I can stop sharing, maybe that's... Uh... Ah, okay. Uh, so yes, what is uh, Arbitrum? Sorry. <laughs> Christian. He's on chat only. Oh, he can't uh, explain. Okay. Okay, um, okay. Yeah, so, so I, as I said, the, the major open problem here is actually, can we get a real life implementation? How, how, how practical would this uh, actually become in, um, uh, in real life because, um, Asymptotically, the overhead is only pod log t, but uh, once we start, this requires providing these snarks about hash functions, and uh, so it all depends on how much overheads that will have in practice. Okay, thanks. Uh, anyone else from, uh, uh, feel free to unmute yourself if you want to ask a question. Um, Otherwise, have some, you know, some dessert break. And, and the next speaker, I believe, is uh, uh, Sri Aravinda, who is uh, in the chat. So you can also start getting ready uh, and show yourself. All right. Thanks, everyone. Thank you, Rafael, again.
Yes, looks like our next speaker is connecting, but muted. Can, can you see me? Can you hear me? Yes. Now we can see and hear you, that's great. So you are in Germany, right? Yes. You still working from home or is it, uh, what is it? <laughs> no, just home. Uh... Um, I, I mean, but you're allowed back at the university in Germany or, or okay. Yeah, within some, uh, I, I guess, within some number limit, right? Uh -huh. Yeah. I guess we have uh, one more minute and you, uh, um, you're you just going to share your slides from the same machine, right? So let's see. Yeah. Uh, okay. So let me, yeah, probably. Let's go. Uh, I gave away the conclusion. Oh no. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, now, can you see the screen? Yeah. So right now we're seeing, of course, the the. Now. Yeah. So this is the the, the I guess the right thing we want to see. Okay. I mean, I'll I'll just leave it there. I don't wanna. Yeah. Disturb this. <laughs> Who knows? How about, uh, how about that, uh, Aros? Like, are you going back? To the yes, office? yes. We are also allowed back uh, to to uh, um, with some, not the full capacity, but like I, don't know, I guess right now we are about eighty percent capacity or something. I see. Oh, that's eighty percent. Yeah. Okay. That's good. Um. All right. So I guess we are. Uh. uh let's try not to accumulate any more uh, uh, delay. So. Our next speaker is uh, uh, Sri Aravinda Krishnan. He is a PhD student at FAU in Germany. And uh, uh, this work was uh, uh, already presented, I believe, at uh, Auckland, right? Yeah. Uh, uh, at IEEE uh, Security and Privacy. And it's about lockable signatures for blockchain, scriptless scripts for all signatures. And uh, you have 30 minutes. So let's try to, to, to stick to the time now. Uh, uh, your, the stage is yours. Thank you. Okay, uh, so I mean, uh, if please tell me, you know, let me know if I'm running over time. Okay, um, all right. So, yeah. Okay, so uh, welcome everyone. Uh, thanks for inviting me for this uh, uh, um, presentation. So I'll be talking about lockable signatures for blockchains. It's a joint work with uh, Julio, who is now at uh, Max Planck Institute for Security and Privacy. Okay. Um, one second. Okay. Perfect. So uh, I, I think the audience are already familiar with cryptocurrency payments. So there you have a user Alice who wants to buy some commodity from Bob and a, a transaction is generated and the transaction is uh, posted onto the blockchain now. Okay, so that, that essentially confirms the payment uh, to Bob. And uh, uh, we have a, 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 we have a scenario where uh, instead of one off payment, uh, what if Alice has to make uh, several payments and at a frequent rate, let, let's say a transaction every minute. Um, and that, then, you know, uh, posting a transaction uh, every minute to the blockchain is, uh, is, a, is, a, is a huge overload and that could be delays and it, it's not great for scalability. All right. So the concept of payment channels was introduced in uh, 2016. Um, uh, and, you know that basically lets uh, payments go through off-chain, and um, um, it, it it happens to be a scalability solution. So in this case, you know there is a there is a shared public key or a shared address between Alice and Bob that is referred to as the channel. There is some coins in the channel, and the channel is set to expire at some time t meaning that after time t, the coins from this channel are uh, refunded back to the original owners, either Alice or Bob. Now, what they do is to make uh, payments, they generate these payment transactions that transfer coins from this channel to the uh, recipient here in this case is Bob. And uh, if, a tr if every payment transaction happens to have one coin each, then Alice uh, and Bob together make up to, uh, can make up to 30 payments. Um, and note that all of these transactions are kept off chain and eventually Bob will post, uh, you know, the most recent transaction on chain, uh, hopefully before time T, right? So notice that now you can make up to 30 payments with at the, at the cost of just two transactions on chain, which is the channel opening and the channel closing. Okay, so this is great. Uh, but what if 
the two users are across different currencies. So what if Alice is using the, you know, the is on the Bitcoin blockchain and Bob is on the uh, Ethereum blockchain. So what happens now? Okay, so this kind of a cross currency payment scenario uh, is facilitated if, uh, you know, uh, users, two, two other users, Carol and Dave in this case, magically appear with, uh, with the requirement that Kale, uh, Carol wants a Bitcoin and is ready to give a Litecoin and Dave wants a Litecoin and is ready to give an Ether. So note that, you know, the currencies are nicely arranged here. So if this happens, then uh, you can have a cross currency payment where Alice pays a Bitcoin to Carol, Carol pays a Litecoin to Dave and Dave pays an uh, Ether to Bob, right? So this is a nice scenario that you would want. And this is indeed uh, facilitated if you are considering payment channel networks. Uh, which is essentially a sequence of payment channels between these uh, these users who are connected. All right. So uh, uh, this this template uh, is uh, is used in the uh, in in the original paper, like uh, from uh, 2016 uh, and also from 2017. So the protocol there relies on a special script called hash time lock script, a hash time lock contract script. Um, and if you want to uh, not rely on such special scripts, a uh, protocol as recently as in 2019 was introduced that, that used a technique called scriptless scripts. Okay, so um, I, I, I won't go into the detail of each of these two protocols separately, but I will give you a high level template of how the payments go through. Um, so the, the parties uh, are assumed to have payment channels among them and uh, they set up the payment transactions, right? So the payment transaction, the first one uh, in this case between Alice and Carol, uh, pays from the channel uh, of Alice and Carol, one Bitcoin to Carol, right? So that's the payment transaction. And similarly, you have the other payment transactions between Carol, Dave and Dave and Bob. Okay, so uh, the high level idea in those two uh, scriptless scripts and the HTLC is that Alice has some kind of a key, a secret key, and Alice gives this key to Bob after setting up all of these payment transactions, of course. And Bob uses this key to essentially complete the payment in some sense, and the payment is now considered valid. Now, the transformation of the payment, you know, from being uh, incomplete to becoming valid. So this transformation leaks the key to Dave, who can now complete the payment from Carol. And similarly, Carol can do the same for the payment from Alice. Okay, so this is the high level template of uh, how these protocols actually function. Okay, so um, of unfortunately there are some uh, issues. So for example, with the HTLC approach, you have something like uh, a wormhole attack, which is um, uh, which essentially um, helps adversaries in this payment path to steal some kinds of honest intermediaries. Okay, so um, that that's that's a wormhole attack on a very high level. Um, um, the HTLC approach suffers from large tra transaction sizes because you are going to use special scripts that are longer in uh, longer than a simple signature verification uh, opcode, um, and it's also uh, uh, bad for on-chain privacy because um, a HTLC script is clearly distinguishable from a regular payment transaction from one user to the other. Right, so HTLC scripts are specially identifiable, and uh, uh, on the other hand, for the scriptless script uh, case, I mean, it, it does not have the wormhole attack. The transaction sizes are small because it's just payment from one user to the other, simple signatures. That's it. Um, the on-chain privacy is good because since they only use signatures, which is what regular transactions do, um, they are not distinguishable from regular transactions. So that's fine. Unfortunately, the scriptless script approach. Um, is tailored for the signature schemes of Schnarr and ECDSA. Um, and um, we also uh, know some scriptless script uh, uh, protocols for some uh, Schnarr style signature schemes like lattice based signatures, uh, which was also proposed in 2020. Okay, so in this, in this work, uh, we, we, we try to answer the question of, can we have a payment channel network that is compatible for all signatures and you want to stay scriptless script, right? You don't want to use special scripts. Um, and uh, more on, on a practical point of view, uh, can we have a, P a payment channel network protocol for a signature scheme like BLS, which has uh, very uh, interesting properties for the cryptocurrency community. Okay. 
so um so what what does this uh, uh, let us do right so you have a, a generic payment channel network protocol what does this give us this basically uh, lets us do cross currency payments across uh, all currencies right so the the currency between alice and carol could be bls using signature scheme with bls carol and dave uh, could could use a post quantum secure signatures for authentication dave and bob could be on a chain that uses hash based signatures for authentication Okay, so the consequence of this is uh, you don't you do you you no longer need to uh, focus on um, uh, incorporating specific features into your cryptocurrency just to facilitate cross currency payments. Just just have a currency on a chain that has authentication using signature schemes like unforgeable signature unforgeable signature schemes, and our protocol is good to go. So you can use our protocol to make cross currency payments. So that's the uh, the punchline of the um, solution. Okay. So uh, the, the, for the uh, for the rest of the talk, I will first briefly describe why the existing approaches fail, and then I will introduce uh, the new techniques that we uh, uh, bring in, and also give a, a outline of the the PCN protocols that we have. Okay. So uh, the the Schnorr and the ECDSA uh, uh, based protocol in 2019 uh, has the following structure. So they have these payment transactions set up like before, as I said before, and additionally they have um, Alice and Carol have uh, some kind of a blinded form of the signature, sigma AC, which is the valid signature on this payment. Uh, so the, note that this blinded form is not a valid signature just yet. Um, and similarly, uh, Carol and Dave have a blinded uh, blinded form of the signature and Dave and Bob have the same. And Alice has some kind of an unblinding key. And um, what Alice does is Alice gives this key to Bob. Bob uses this key to uh, you know, unblind the, the, the partial signature that he had to complete the signature sigma db. Along with, with this signature along with the payment transaction is a, is a valid payment that can be posted on chain. And Similarly, Dave, sorry, Dave can also learn the unblinding key, unblind the signature, and Carol does the same. Okay, so this is like the uh, high-level idea that they have, and uh, to just look at it more closely, uh, they are able to do this uh, blinding and unblinding because uh, the uh, Alice in this case, who is the sender, can manipulate the randomness that is uh, that is necessary in these signatures. Um, so. Just to give an idea, um, so let's say that the payment transaction uh, between Alice and Carol is this M1, uh, and uh, between Carol and Dave is M2, and they have these shared public uh, keys between them, which are the channels. Okay, so what Alice does is Alice picks uh, these two uh, uh, integers, y1, y2, um, gives, uh, gives, uh, gives Carol the, uh, the group elements, uh, capital Y1, uh, Y2, and the uh, D log value uh, Y1. Uh, Dave, you know, has Y1, Y2. Okay, for this is like a setup before the payments are done. Um, now, the the blinded form of the signatures um, is is of this form, right? So the the the, the group element part of the Schnarr signature um, has this product uh, Y1, Y2, Y1 times Y2, uh, but the integer integer part of the signature, right, uh, misses the corresponding D log values. It does not have Y1 plus Y2. Right? So in, in some sense, y1 plus y2 acts as a mask um, uh, that, needs to be, uh, that needs to be removed for this blinded signature to become a valid signature. Right? So this is the high level idea and Alice is able to control uh, the, the, uh, the randomness uh, R, A, C uh, here. Right? So uh, she is able to insert this uh, group elements into it. So this is why they are able to, this is the core idea that they exploit for doing it for Schnorr signatures. Okay, so can, why, why doesn't this uh, technique, uh, you know, apply for other signatures? So consider this case where, you know, they have these payment transactions and these blinded signatures are also set up. Okay, so if for, if in some case, uh, if Carol and Dave are able to unblind their signature and, and get the valid signature by themselves, right, without Alice initiating any kind of uh, unblinding key, then this means that Carol, since Carol learned Sigma CD, can also unblind uh, and learn Sigma AC. And th this, this essentially means that, you know, Alice is paying to Dave, right? Alice is not paying to uh, Bob, but instead to Dave. So 
This is actually possible in uh, like uh, BLS signatures where the signatures are unique with respect to a message and a public key. Um, so notice the case that, uh, okay, so Alice and Carol set up this blind uh, blinded signature, Sigma uh, AC, right? What, whatever form of blinding that you do. Um, now what Carol and Dave can do is they can together generate Sigma CD, right? Which is which they can do because it's a unique signature. They both have the shares of the secret key. So they can generate the one and only valid signature Sigma CD. And by the property of this blinding and blinding, it is the case that Carol can use Sigma CD to unblind Sigma AC. Uh, and, and that's also a valid signature because it's, it's a unique signature, right? So there's only one and there's only one Sigma AC that's valid. Now, this essentially means that uh, Alice is paying to Dave, but not Bob. So the payment does not reach Bob. Um, and the, the failure here happens because Alice is no longer able to control the uh, randomness of the signature. So there's no randomness here. Okay. So, uh, so what are the what are the missing pieces here? Um, so we want a, a generic uh, blinding and blinding procedure that does not per se depend on the structure of the signature schemes, and we want some sort of a control for Alice, who is the sender in our case, in the unblinding procedure, right? So we don't want two intermediate two intermediate users to just collude and themselves release the payment. We want Alice to have some sort of a control. Okay. So we have um, lockable signatures at the cryptographic layer for the un, uh, blinding and blinding procedure. So what, what is this uh, technique? So consider that you have uh, two tuples like uh, message public key secret key tuples. Um, these two tuples are input into a lock algorithm and it outputs a lock, okay? And uh, what, is the, what is the functionality that we want? Um, is that given sigma tilde with the red one here, a valid uh, sigma tilde, if you have an unlock, you, you can have an unlock algorithm that takes as input both the lock and sigma tilde, and it outputs the uh, signature sigma such that it's a valid signature on this green tuple over here, right? So uh, for, for convenience, I will refer to sigma tilde as the locking signature and to sigma as the locked signature, right? So given the locking signature, I can get the locked signature, okay? So the property that we want is uh, that of hiding, right? So this is a simulation style definition where you, you generate the lock honestly and uh, an adversary should not be able to distinguish this case from a lock that is generated by a simulator where the simulator does not have access to the uh, secret keys like SK and SK tilde. So, and, and uh, we also want unlockability uh, and this property uh, intuitively says that, you know, an adversary uh, outputs a correctly generated lock and uh, a valid locking signature. And it should, uh, it should not be the case that when you try to unlock, you get a invalid locked signature, right? So this should happen only with negligible probability. So these are the two security notions that we want uh, from lockable signatures. Okay, so we, we can have a generic construction, which is, uh, uh, which, which is just a, a one-time pad uh, between a one-time pad of the locked signature with the hash of the locking signature. Okay, so and and, uh, uh, and the unlock procedure is simple. So you take the sigma tilde, hash it, and then XOR it away. So this is the gen like a, a generic construction that you can have. And for BLS, uh, you can you can do something clever here because um, we have the property that uh, if you if you have an aggregate signature that is an aggregate of two signatures, it is hard for an adversary to extract uh, either one of them. Right, so this is a nice property. So what you can do is that the lock now is simply the aggregate of the locked and the locking signature. Okay, and uh, the unlock procedure simply uh, divides away the uh, the locking signature, and you get the locked signature. Okay, and we uh, we rely on the uh, the uniqueness property as well, but uh, I'll come to that later. Okay, so we can actually prove weak hiding property and we introduce this new simplifying assumption that that's called aggregate extract. Uh, oh, sorry, it, it, it essentially depends on aggregate extraction assumption, but in the proof, we have a simplifying assumption. Uh, you, can, you can take a look at the paper for that. Okay. Um, okay, so we also uh, bypass a, a, a very cool impossibility result that was, uh, that was recently proposed that you can't uh, have uh, adapter signatures for BLS uh, signatures. And uh, we are able to bypass this 
because our lockable signatures is, is actually a weaker primitive in the sense that for the locking algorithm requires the secret keys, both secret keys. But in the case of adapter signatures, uh, you, you, you do not know the witness when you are generating this lock uh, per se. Okay, so that's why we are able to bypass that imp impossibility result. Okay, so on the transaction layer, then we have uh, what is called a local three-party channel. Okay, so this intuitively, uh, uh, we, are, we are doing this because we want to give uh, some sort of a control for Alice uh, to, um, uh, to uh, you know, uh, unblind the payments. Okay, so in this case, you have Carol and Dave who have a channel like before. What they do is they have a setup transaction that transfers the coins from their two-party channel to a three-party channel, right? And uh, the three-party channel is additionally controlled by Alice. So now you have Alice, Carol, and Dave who need to jointly authorize the spending from this three-party channel. Uh, the crucial thing is that this setup transaction is kept local and it's not posted on chain, okay? So that's why you have this local three-party channel. Um, and uh, of course, you want this local, of course, this uh, this three-party channel to expire, and it has to expire, uh, you know, um, uh, at a convenient time. Okay, so uh, to give you uh, the sense of the generic PCN protocol, so you have the payment setup phase where parties have these two-party channels, and they have the uh, they then set up these uh, setup transactions that transform each of their two-party channel into a three-party channel. Okay, so now. Uh, at the end of the setup phase, all the parties are left with uh, three party channels between them. Okay, so you then have a, a payment lock phase where uh, you the parties set up these payment transactions, but these payment transactions, instead of spending from the two party channels, now spend from the three party channels, right? Which were set up in the setup phase. Okay, so uh, after this point, uh, Alice, uh, so what they do is uh, the parties in, in this payment path generate a lock uh, such that, you know, uh, uh, the, green, the green signature is the locked signature and the red signature is the uh, locking signature, all right? Um, and then they generate the locks, uh, 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 you know, consecutively. Okay, so what are the, uh, you know, how are these locks set up? I will come to that now. Okay, so at the end of the payment lock phase, you, you have these uh, locks generated. And how, how, how do you generate these locks? Um, you, you run a general purpose MPC protocol. Uh, first, that is run between Alice, Carol, and Dave to generate this lock, the first one that I, uh, the, that I showed. The second one involves all the four parties uh, to generate the lock. And finally, you have Alice, Dave, and Bob running the final lock uh, uh, that 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 has sigma ADB and sigma star in, in it. Okay, so uh, the requirement from the MPC protocol that uh, that we are going to use to generate these locks is that we do not want uh, any fairness or guaranteed output delivery. Uh, we we only uh, you know want security with our bots. Okay, uh, and the functionality of the MPC is, is crucial in that it should check the consistency between these locks. So the locking signature of the first lock is the locked signature of the second lock, right? And the locking signature of the second lock is the locked signature of the third lock. So this consistency is also ensured inside the MPC. Okay, so once you have these locks, you, you go into the payment release phase where the payments are actually made. Okay, so now Alice and Bob, uh, they jointly generate the Sigma star, which is like some random signature on some random message. Right. So once this signature is generated, uh, Bob has a sigma star, and Bob is able to unlock sigma ADB, which is a valid signature on the payment from Dave, and this cascades uh, to Dave and then to Carol. Right. So this this we can crucially do because the locks are you know generated consistently. Okay. Um, to finalize the payment, in the end, the parties post the setup transactions and also the payment transactions on chain. Okay. All right, so uh, on, a, uh, on a very high level, the security uh, relies on the security of the lockable signatures. Um, you know, uh, the uh, uh, a locked signature cannot be revealed before a locking signature by the property of the, uh, the, lock, uh, the hiding property of the lock, uh, lockable signatures. And um, if someone uh, reveals a valid uh, locking signature, the other party must be able to unlock a valid locked signature. And this follows from the unlockability property of uh, the primitive. 
Okay, so for the BLS case, uh, uh, everything is the same. So the setup is the same, the release is the same. Uh, what the, the main efficiency gain that we get is that we are able to replace the generic purpose MPC uh, with, a, with a slightly uh, clever interactive protocol. So let's look at how the lock is generated for Dave, right? So uh, you have these two payment transactions. Dave has one on the left and one on the right. Uh, Bob, Bob sends a valid signature on the payment on the right and Carol sends a valid signature on, uh, on the payment on the left. So Dave verifies these two signatures. These two signatures are basically BLS signatures. Perfect. Then Alice sends an aggregate, uh, an aggregate signature of you know, sigma A green and uh, sigma A red, which are essentially uh, signatures of Alice on both these uh, transactions respectively. So Dave uh, verifies this aggregate signature, and Dave sets the lock locally as the aggregate as the as the aggregate of all signatures, right? So the signature from given by Carol, Bob, Alice, and its own signature, uh, Dave's own signature on both these payment transactions. So this lock is locally held by Dave, and notice that if um, uh, you know the all the red components are uh, essentially revealed, Dave learns all the green components, right? So uh, this 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 essentially lets us uh, you know remove the need of MPC as a, on the, uh, as a whole. Okay. Uh, the security uh, the the idea is uh, pretty similar. You know you rely on the hiding property uh, the weak hiding property of the BLS based lockable signatures. Um, and uh, for the case where someone reveals a valid uh, locking signature, you know, it's it's unconditional because the BLS signatures are unique. So um, there's no way that you would uh, get an uh, invalid locked signature. So that, that's that's unconditional. Okay. So finally, uh, in terms of uh, numbers, um, you can see that uh, uh, because we ex uh, exploit the aggregation and the uniqueness property of uh, BLS signatures, we are able to significantly save in terms of uh, communication during the locking phase. Uh, compared to the Schnarr and the ECDSA counterparts. Uh, this intuitively we can do because uh, if a party has generated a signature on a particular message uh, it, and, and it has you know, uh, sent it to other parties, it need not send it again. But this you had to do in the Schnarr and ECDSA case because uh, the, the signing party would use different randomness in different uh, iterations of signing. This is not possible in BLS and this helps us uh, the parties can save, uh, you know, in both in signing time and both, uh, and also in terms of uh, communicating the signature. So this this is quite competitive uh, in both in terms of time and communication in the locking phase. All right. We only have so, two minutes left. Oh, yeah. I'm sorry. Yeah. Yeah, I'm there. So um, yeah, I had to rush. Sorry. Um, okay. So in conclusion, we we now have a cross currency payment protocol that lets us do uh, payments across any currency irrespective of uh, uh, what unforgeable signature scheme that it uses. Um, our generic protocol is, is, more as a, is, is shown more as a feasibility and it's not quite efficient in practice, but what it gives us is a nice blueprint to develop efficient protocols for other signature schemes of interest. The, uh, and evidence of that was uh, our BLS-based uh, PCN protocol. Um, the nice tools that we introduce in this work are, you know, lockable signatures and the local three-party channels. And we also have some follow-up works that extend these tools. Um, and in terms of open problems, um, one asks if if we are if we can have a dynamic routing-based PCN protocol that is generic, um, um, and and if we can have efficient PCN protocols for other signature schemes other than BLS. Um, so thank you, uh, thank you for listening. You know, feel free to check the paper. And if you have any questions, uh, I'm available on chat also, it's fine. So thank you, thank you. So thank you for the very nice talk. So are there any questions uh, from the chat or from the audience? Uh... I probably need to stop. So, so I was wondering, did you try with any other kind of signature scheme and it didn't work or? or, or uh... No, we, we didn't. We actually set out to do it for BLS and we were mm -hmm. quite content once we did it. Uh, but yeah, so would entire say, for instance, be a natural? I mean, I know that it's not you know very popular these days, but wouldn't be very also natural target uh, RSA uh, signatures for other signatures? You mean RSA signature? RSA. Uh, okay. Um, 
good question uh, we we do not think about doing it for rsa signature i mean our we yeah yeah, we couldn't find uh, like uh, a scope for currencies to use RSA signature. I, I agree. Yeah. <laughs> if, if, but it's a good question. Uh, Just, uh, maybe, maybe, maybe it's a good project for for a, a, you know some, some master student to see if, whether your blueprint is uh, <laughs> how easy to follow your blueprint. Yeah, fair enough. Any other question from from uh, the audience? Looks like not. So I guess we'll move. Thank you again. And let's move to the next speaker, which uh, should be Mingyu Liang, who was before in chat and, and uh, should be alive and, and connected to the internet. Yeah. Hi, can you hear me? Hello. Yes. Yes. And now I just Welcome. need to share my screen. OK, can you see my screen? Yes, we can see your screen. Uh, so uh, how badly did I pronounce your, did I mispronounce your name? Uh, I apologize for that. <laughs> oh, no, no, it's, it's very close. Yeah, Ming Yu Liang, yeah. Okay, great. So our next speaker is Ming Yu Liang. Uh, differentiate private mixing from cryptocurrencies. Uh, um, is this work been, uh, 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 has already appeared somewhere? Uh, it's currently in submission to Paris. Okay, great. Thank you. The stage is yours. Okay. okay. Okay, um, so hi everyone. Uh, my, my name is Ming Yu Liang, and uh, thank you very much for inviting me to talk here. Uh, so, I would like to talk about our work, and this is uh, a joint work with Fortini for Deep Sea, Dolph Gordon, Iona, Karen Titled, and Ma Young Warrior. Okay. So, in the past, there were many studies on the anonymity issues of cryptocurrency. For example, Bitcoin transactions are only pseudo anonymous and linkable. Through some simple transaction pattern, edges belong to the same user can be identified. Moreover, aided by the external data and active attack, the adversary can de anonymize cluster of edges belonging to the same person or entity, causing a slow ball effect on loss of privacy. To tackle such issue, there are many efforts on breaking the linkage among the transactions, and one of the most classical ideas is to use a mixing mechanism. Uh, for example, for multiple users here, each have their cons stored in a potentially identified address. Uh, they would mix their cons together and deposit them into newly generated address. And the set of newly generated address formed an anonymity set. Intuitively, the size of anonymity set directly affect how much privacy any missing party gets. And such missing mechanism can be uh, centralized, which relies on trust on and trust third party, or it can be decentralized, which relies on anonymous broadcast and conjunct to generate a single transaction for multiple parties. There are also standalone cryptocurrency that give privacy guarantee by themselves. And two of the most successful ones on the market are Monero and Zcash. Uh, Monero transaction use ring signature to allow the real standard to rope in others' input as mixing. Therefore, any observer can verify that transaction is signed by one of the parties in the input set, but does not know which party is the real signer. On the other hand, Zcash relies on zero knowledge proof uh, for its shielded transaction to completely hide the input and output of a transaction. However, there are various shortcomings of the solution we described above. Uh, in particular, any solution for Bitcoin based on conjun has an inherent limit of, on the size of anonymity set due to the maximum size of a transaction that can fit into a single block. For, for Monero, there is also a limit on how much edges you can roll in. By default, it is set to 10 mixing and the communication cost is linear to the number of mixing if you want to include more. Uh, for Zcash, the current implementation requires trust data and it is less efficient without it. Um, on the other hand, it does offer the strongest privacy if everyone uses the shield versions, but most of the transactions are unshielded, uh, which can lead to the same kind of um, uh, identifiable standing pattern just like Bitcoin. As a result, our goal is to build a solution 
such that uh, it would give a formal privacy guarantee and security under composability. And ideally, we would like to accommodate very large vulnerability instead, for example, n greater than 1,000. And uh, our solution should not require trust setup or any trust or untrust third party. And last but not least, in order to be scalable, uh, it should have a some linear computation cost per party. Okay. So how do we do that? We do that by allowing some controlled leakage. Um, to achieve our eventual goal, we start by using ring signature based transaction to create a lot limited set of small sites. So consider this example of three users missing on the right. Um, so basically each user on an input address at the top level and, um, and a freshly generate output address at the bottom layer. So each user um, paid their corresponding output address while roping in other input address as mixing. So here, party one pay to her address below and also roll in the um, party two and party three's uh, address as mixing. So um, yeah, so basically uh, the same goes for party two and three. And one advantage of using ring signature based anonymous transactions is we don't need to broadcast the output address beforehand. So everyone just generate their output address and make the transaction as long as they know the input address of the other party, which should already be um, on blockchain. Um, however, this solution does not uh, scale to um, um, end size along the set because the computation call is uh, uh, linear to the size. Instead, to achieve a large along the set, our core idea is to use butterfly level to augment this small anonymity set we just created. So this is an example of two RE A size butterfly level. A size means that for any, uh, any layer, there are eight nodes. And two RE means that for, any, for every node, except for the last layer, uh, it has uh, two um, nodes, uh, it collects the two nodes uh, right below it. And, and the reason it's called butterfly network, it's you can kind of draw this butterfly network by repeating this uh, butterfly pattern. And for the first two layer, you want to pair up those nodes that differ only in the most significant B. And that is if you label this uh, node from zero to seven and using the uh, binary representations, uh, you pair up Z and four because they differ in most significant, uh, significant bit and one and five, two and six and three and seven. For the second and third layers, um, you basically shrink the butterfly by a half and you pair, up, uh, pair up those nodes uh, that differ in the second most significant bit. And for the last layer, you pair those uh, differ on the um, least significant bit. So we call the first or top layer, the input, uh, top layer nodes, the input nodes, which corresponding to the input address uh, of the mixing party and the last or bottom layer nodes as the output nodes which corresponding to the, uh, the output edges. And notice that by the uh, butterfly level, there is a new leak path from any input nodes to any output. Okay, so now let's consider an even simpler example of four size uh, butterfly level uh, used for four party mixing. So uh, for simplicity, let's assume that there is a way to randomly pick a permutation to position their output edges. And in this case, we have uh, the permutation one, three, two, four, basically one and four just pay to the address directly below and two and three uh, uh, swap their output position. So to transfer one's coin from input address to output address, each user follows strictly the unique part defined by the uh, underlying butterfly network and creating the intermediate address to forward a coin. So they first pay to their coins in the intermediate address and then make a second transaction to pay to their output address. So clearly um, due to the uh, topology of butterfly network, there can be collision. So we use a bucket instead of nodes for all the intermediate conjunction. Okay. So apparently for now, 
um, the transaction graph is non-private. And our first step is to make sure that the address is residing in the same bucket to be uh, indistinguishable to each other. To achieve this, we uh, make sure that all transactions made to this address within the same bucket share the same input set, um, effectively creating a small uh, anonymity set. So basically, uh, for party three, while paying her real value from her address, input address to her uh, intermediate address, she also wrote in the um, uh, in, uh, party one's address as mixing. So the same goes for party one, and now this one and three can be think of an uh, anonymity set. And also for the outgoing uh, transaction, we enforce the same rules to make this address completely indistinguishable. So in the end, um, the only remaining leakage here, it can, can be represented as the number of uh, edges within each bucket, or simply the intermediate bu uh, layer bucket nodes. Um, however, this leakage can still tell you something about the underlying permutation that it's used. For example, if you consider uh, use a different permutation, one, two, three, four, and then um, the intermediate bucket nodes will be one, 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 one. Basically, everyone just use the bucket directly below them to pass their uh, coin. Okay. To resolve this, uh, we randomize the linkage, leakage by adding noise. Moreover, to avoid excessive amount of noise, we borrow the elegant idea from differential privacy, and we only require enough noise to hide between labeling permutation rather than any arbitrary permutation. So for labeling permutations, um, we means for pi and pi pi, uh, they are labeled if and only if they have a swap distance of one, where the swap distance denotes the minimum number of exchange of two elements of pi required to produce pi pi. So like here, uh, we have permutation one, three, two, four, and if we swap two and three, we get one, two, three, four, which is one of the labor permutation of so before we go ahead and show how we make the bucket node uh, noisy, let's pause for a moment to see why this privacy guarantee on labor implementation is meaningful. Intuitively, by making sure that for any labor implementation, the probability to generate any leakage is similar, we give any party a plausible alibi to claim that there is an additional swap between their uh, output address and any other party's output edges. And this uncertainty gives an, um, more like an individual level of privacy. Okay. So to make this uh, intermediate layer bucket nodes noisy, um, so on the left, we have two intermediate bucket nodes corresponding to the two labor implementation we just showed. Um, and on the right, uh, we add some number of noisy edges for, um, um, for nodes uh, corresponding to pi. And we enforce the same rule for noisy edges uh, within a bucket on roping in mixing to make them indistinguishable with the real edges. Apparently, any noisy transaction to this noisy edges should contain zero value. So in, in addition, we also require confidential transaction to hide the transfer value to make them indistinguishable to real edges. So now look at this noisy intermediate bucket node, and now it became a plausible explanation for both pi and pi. pi. See? So formally, we give the definition for differential prior mixing. So capital L here, it's the randomized leakage function that take a, a permutation as input and uh, output a noisy intermediate bucket node. Uh, for labeling permutations, uh, for any labeling permutation and any uh, subset of possible leakage, the probability that it is generated from pi and the probability it's generated from pi pi should be close. And the close list is measured by the uh, e to the epsilon and delta, like in the traditional approximate differential privacy. So what the leakage function does, it essentially sample the number of a certain amount of noisy edges for each bucket 
and uh, uh, from a likely binomial distribution and add them to the number of real edges. And the reason we used negative binomial distribution instead of Laplacian distribution or Gaussian distribution, which are commonly used in classical differential privacy, uh, it's that negative binomial distribution has two nice properties that fit into our scenario. Um, so first of all, uh, and I would lay my suggest, negative binomial distribution actually have non-negative integer support. Um, so uh, this is more this is important because the value we sample essentially corresponding to the uh, number of noisy edges that we want to add to, into a bucket. So it only makes sense if this value is non-negative integer. And, and perhaps most importantly, a negative binomial distribution is infinite divisible, which means that we can divide the noise sampling responsibility equally to all the n parties. And this results in no interaction needed uh, when creating such noise. And in particular, uh, if we divide um, a random variable um, following a negative binomial distribution to uh, n parts, uh, we probably will very likely to end up with a polar distribution, which is basically a generalization of negative binomial distribution with its parameter art being any possible, uh, any positive real world. Okay. So now let's go over the, uh, with all the truths ready. Let's walk through a, a simplified version of our protocol. Uh, at the very beginning, all party agrees on everyone's initial position, and this can be just a basic graphic order, uh, as well as the tie to start mixing. And uh, our protocol do not rely on additional alarms broadcast, so each party independently choose an output position. And so this can cause uh, a collision as well, so we change the output layer from nodes to bucky uh, as well. And we apply arbitrary tie breaking to determine the unique uh, permutation. So once every party has determined their input edges and their output edges, uh, they can determine their unique path uh, following the underlying butterfly network uh, so that they can create uh, intermediate edges in the corresponding bucket. And they also sample uh, a certain amount of noisy edges from the polar distributions and uh, um, and basically uh, create these uh, noisy edges. At this point, uh, everything is offline. So everyone just kept their address locally. And um, yeah. Okay. So in the online phase, uh, they will uh, um, make transactions uh, to their uh, address, whether it's the real address um, in, uh, or the noisy address they created. And to avoid easy correlation, uh, we wait until everyone complete their. Uh, transaction in the first two layers before we go to the last two layers. And hopefully at this point, I have convinced you that uh, the only form of leakage is the, in, uh, the noisy intermediate bus nodes. Okay. So our actual protocol is a little bit more complicated to make sure that it is both efficient and robust. But one thing we don't have or we don't really need is that detection of honest and malicious party abroad, uh, as they do not hinder the remaining honest online users from transferring their uh, values. And also when such a bot happened, uh, we have a smooth privacy loss. Uh, assume that there are a total of F aborted parties, and let's say these abort can happen in any phase, but we can simply assume in the end, um, op aborted parties publicly reveal their real and noisy edges. Thus, the effective alarmability set reduced to n minus f, and the effective noise magnitude reduced to n minus s divided by n ties the original amount. And formally, the DP guarantee still holds for partial permutation among the remaining n minus f parties with degrading privacy parameters. And the later issue can be addressed in the advance by increasing the noise magnitude to offset the potential loss of uh, noise. And overall, our protocol offers smooth tolerance of fail stop uh, adversary without uh, any additional steps. 
So we also give the asymptotic analysis of our protocol using the uh, butterfly networks with different areas. Uh, for the naive K, which I list uh, as the green column here, the computation cost per party is minimal to the holonimity set size. In comparison, our protocol requires a square root of n cost uh, if we use a square root of n but every butterfly network. And if we use a true every butterfly network, uh, it can be further reduced to uh, log qn. Uh, but for the value of n that we are interested in, uh, square root of n uh, every butterfly network is actually uh, more practical. Uh, and we conduct experience, uh, experiments measuring the computation cost per party uh, with different privacy, uh, privacy parameters uh, using a square root of n every butterfly network. Uh, so the graph on the right showed our experience result uh, compared to the naive case. And of course, the better the privacy parameters are, uh, the uh, costly the computation is as we need to add more uh, noisy edges. Okay, uh, finally, um, um, in conclusion, um, our computation type per party for n party mixing is sublinear, uh, which is a um, polylog end. And we offer smooth tolerance of file store adversary if a party abort is slightly reduced privacy, but the protocol can continue without any special action. And we do not require any trust setup. And also in our uh, full paper, we have uh, proved that uh, our construction is UC secure. Um, for weeklies, uh, apparently we do not provide a full anonymity, but rather bound the leakage using the definition of differential privacy. And also like all other mixing protocol, we can only mix edges uh, of online parties. Okay. Um, uh, that's all, uh, thank you very much. Uh, any questions? Thank you, we have time for uh, uh, questions from the chat or from the audience if there are any. I guess I can start with one. So, so I mean, every time you talk about uh, um, differential privacy, right? There is a question of how to choose the parameters, and in the experiments, you had some some values. Um, right. Whether you could uh, maybe comment more on this. Uh, right. So, uh, so basically, for this uh, for value uh, for curve here, uh, we choose um, from the um, worst price parameter to the best parameters. We choose as long to be link 10 and delta to be 10 to the negative four. In the best case, we choose uh, epsilon to be link two and delta to be 10 to the uh, negative six. So um, these values are chosen uh, are commonly in the similar application like in the differential prior or anonymous, uh, anonymous uh, communications. Uh, so, so basically gives the, use the same parameters. Thanks. Um, questions from the audience? Um, looks not. So I suggest we uh, 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 switch to the next speaker, but we also wait a couple of minutes and we start uh, 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 on time. So in, 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 in a few minutes when the clock hits, uh, I guess, 5 UTC. Thank you again, Mingyu. OK, thank you. And uh, uh, so, um, you said Christoph can start uh, uh, connecting and, and doing these things. Genau. All right. So just let's just wait until the clock uh, hits uh, uh, five minutes. Yeah, yeah. If anyone was definitely. Waiting for this.
All right. So for the last talk of the last session of Theory and Practice of, of Blockchain 2021, we have Foundation of Ring Sampling uh, by Christoph Egger, who is also from FAU. Uh, I believe we are getting a sneak peek of a, another talk that uh, this is uh, going to appear at uh, PETS, right? Oh, we cannot hear you now. I, I don't know if it's my connection or your connection. In a week or two. Okay, yes. So I got yes. to speak uh, uh, from an upcoming conference. And I had some problem hearing you now. I don't know if it was my internet or your internet, but let's hope it uh, goes better from now on. The floor is yours. Uh, let's see, let's see. Um, anyways. Um, all right, uh, so um, this is... Uh, work that we're going to present at PET soon. And it's joint work with Victoria, Russell, Dominic, and Huber. And um, we start from, uh, fr from the concept of ring signatures that you have heard before, like a few seconds ago. And here we have a primitive that is usually thought to be cryptographically secure. So the idea is you, ha you have a bunch of people, uh, like in this picture, and one of them um, is signing a message. and. Uh, we want two uh, settings basically to be uh, indistinguishable, like this one and a second one where the message is signed by a different uh, group member. Um, so like there's a judge and decides which, which of these two um, settings is, is, is reality and you get cryptographic primitives, so cryptographic security. So there's only a negligible possibility for an efficient des uh, decider, distinguisher um, to actually draw in conclusion. Uh, however, the setting kind of becomes interesting once, once you add a lot of additional parties. So if you have many participants in the uh, system, you may not want to include every participant in your ring signature, uh, especially as these things tend to be linear in the size of people that you include, and then things blow up and become inefficient. And so it kind of becomes very important to figure out how to select the right members. And of course, this is um, motivated by anonymous cryptocurrencies. And the original approach taken there was just to sample uniform from all um, potential signers, um, which is highly problematic for the very easy, uh, very obvious reason that not everyone who could potentially create a transaction is actually even uh, equally likely. So if you see a transaction and it has one very one person in the set that is very likely to have signed this transaction and a lot of people that are really unlikely to have signed it, then you probably already know who, who created the signature. And this, uh, the anonymity of your system is considerably worse than what you, were, uh, uh, what you had in mind. Um, the kind of solution that was proposed and implemented there is um, uh, to select a, according to some distribution distribution that is um, likely or assumed to be the actual uh, spender distribution. So you, si you don't uh, sample your decoys uh, right, like uniformly, but you sample them uh, with the same probability that they actually have to sign themselves. And this is assumed to be good. And we will actually figure out that this actually is a good approach. Um, but of course, like the, the question remains, what is actually um, a good distribution? Uh, what, or what is a good sampling? Uh, what does it mean to be good uh, with respect to what is, uh, is such a sampling uh, procedure good? And this turns out to be a quite non-trivial question. And to that regard, we are looking at uh, a few natural sampling strategies. Uh, the first one is uniform. You just sample uniformly from the set of all possible signers, uh, as we've seen before. That kind of works, of course. Uh, then there's the idea of sampling with the same distribution that a person would actually also be like uh, be be expected to sign a message. So uh, the idea here is it might be very very unlike that this participant in my ring um, is actually the signer. But it's also very, very unlikely that this person was sampled as a decoy in this, uh, for, for this transaction. 
And the idea or the intuition is that these two uh, cancel out and you basically don't know anything about who in this um, set of actual signers that you have cryptographically um, that, that would be the, uh, the actual signer. And then there's a third idea. And basically the thing is we noticed uniform sampling wasn't a particularly smart idea. And the problem here is that um, potential signers have vastly different probabilities to actually sign such a transaction or such a message. And here the idea is in a way to create a setting where all the to actually also sign this. Um, yeah. So how does this work in, in detail? You have a bunch of potential signers and you, you chop this up into slices and you hope that at least within one slice, the probability of the, this one uh, person to make this transaction or sign this transaction um, is equal. And uh, then you can just create rings within these, uh, these petitions. Um, and this is kind of justified if you look at uh, classical examples of anonymous currencies. Uh, usually the one information that is obviously leaked or the, that is clearly leaked to the, uh, from that system is, is the age of the transaction. And the leakage that you would uh, you often look at is like the, the fact that um, addresses that very recently received some value will also with high probability use that uh, money quite soon again. Um, so chopping them up into pieces that are exactly the same age, so like within one block, for example, um, seems to uh, provide a reasonable trade-off. So you can kind of say they have the same probability. So this is the idea. Then, then you have a second problem. Uh, I mean, you want to evaluate your, your ring sampling strategies, right? And um, for, for this evaluation, you need to some, some sort of ground truth. And um, as we're dealing with an, an anonymous systems, uh, this is not super easy to come to. Um, what has been done in the past, and we're kind of also following this path, is I, I mean, you can have some probably unrealistic assumptions like the distribution is just uniform. Um, but that, as we've seen, like this says, like uh, our uniform sampler would be pretty good, which it is not. And you can maybe draw conclusions from a non-anonymous -anon system. So you can say like, I know a lot of things about Bitcoin transactions. I can do some guesswork to see, to say like, this is how, how people behave in, in, in Bitcoin. We believe that people might behave similarly in other currencies and, and go from there. And um, to that end, we, we kind of looked at uh, Bitcoin transactions. And here we uh, look at the age of a transaction at the point when it's spent. And yeah, we can, we can uh, fit some, uh, some probability distributions in there. And our conclusion is like a shifted Pareto distribution seems to very nicely capture reality. And this is why we will use that as a baseline distribution. Um, I've already also said earlier that Monero is, use, is assuming some uh, gamma distribution, um, which is why we also included that distribution in, in the analysis. So um, this is, okay, this is the distribution they sample to, but their idea obviously is, or their idea is that they sample the same distribution that they believe um, people would use. So this is basically our ground truth and it's not particularly great. So yeah, it's in a way, it's just advanced guessing. And I'm not sure there's much we can do about that part actually. Um, yeah, so this is um, where we start from. And then um, question is how do you define uh, a good sampling strategy? And um, one thing that has been like proposed in the past and re uh, used repeatedly in anonymous communication literature is to basically go via entropy. Um, the idea is basically how much information do you still could you uh, is still to be learned 
about who initi initiates this anonymous action after you've uh, observed the system. So you know how the system behaves, and then you're, you're asked to guess like who did sign this transaction. Um, this is uh, the uh, this entropy notion, and it's kind of convenient. Uh, We have a number that is somewhat compared to different setters, different currencies that you want to compare the anonymity of, uh, do stuff like that. And it all uh, kind of neatly ties into advantage. Of course, you don't, you will not get into, into the like in the order of magnitude of a security parameter or something like that. Um, but well, there's just like, this is how it is. Um, so how do, do we go there? Um, there? There are many ways of, uh, of looking at entropy and looking at probabilities, and we're kind of conservative here. So we uh, to uh, take min entropy or guessing entropy. And this is basically the probability of guessing um, the maximum over all, all, all possible. So, so we, we take the probability of guessing the, like, the most likely event. Um, and we also need this in a conditional setting. So um, given some site information, what is the guessing probability of, yeah, what is the guessing pr uh, uh, probability? And then lift this to an entropy setting, where we just like, it's just like taking logarithms essentially for, for both of those definitions. And then you end up at uh, what we call anonymity in, in this work. And it's really just what you expect. So you hear we give this, this is the ring sampling algorithm. So the probability uh, here, here we have this um, uh, as like uh, conditional uh, information. You have, the, you, you're given the ring sampled and you have to figure out how much information is still hidden or is still there about the actual signer of, of this message. Um, yeah, so. This gives you a value and it has kind of like a neat interpretation in, in many ways. So say um, if you have if you get like an, an anonymity of five, then it means like two to the five people are your effective anonymity side size. And you're basically as well hidden as among 32 equally likely people. Um, and um, this is what we what we ended up uh, comparing in uh, to this end. Um, then what you of, of course absolutely do want is some sort of robustness um, because as I said earlier, we don't, we don't even remotely know how, how the real distribution of spenders look like. And now if you have like a comparison of different sampling strategies for, yeah, and they give you some numbers and this one looks way better than the other one, then maybe you actually would like to have a result that Tells, like, like you would like to rely on that fact, but you don't even know um, like like what the real distribution is. So you should be able to tolerate some divergence in the um, in the actual spender or, or signer distribution. And this is exactly what um, robustness gives us here. So if we have a reasonable good guess at what the actual um, signer distribution would have been, then anonymity also gives us an reasonable approximation of um, the actual anonymity in the actual system. So, yeah. This is pretty good in that regard or useful. Um, and then once you have such a uh, definition, you kind of start by looking at uh, corner cases, edge cases. And one obvious example that you want to look at is, is looking at, at an all sampler. Here, the all sampler is basically the simple setting, the trivial setting, right? So I said, you could have the setting where you really, really have a ring signature by everyone. And what you would hope for is that if you include everyone in your ring signature, you basically get an optimal anonymity value. And our result here can be interpreted in exactly this way. And it says basically the, um, uh, the anonymity in such an all sampler is, uh, only depends on the, um, like on the on the signer distribution, and of course, if you already know beforehand who will be the next signer, 
then there's no hope to uh, have any more anonymity in the system left. But if there is a high level of entropy in the system, so you don't really know who is going to be the next signer, then our anonymity definition will tell you that this is perfectly preserved. So it still stands there. It says you exactly um, yeah, how much anonymity you expect to have in such an all sampling setting. Um, then the other corner case is the one sampler. And obviously, if you have a ring signature that is signed by exactly one person, then you shouldn't have any anonymity left. Because obviously, you know that this one person who is the only potential, this is also exactly what we get here. Um, so you have an anonymity of zero, which is also kind of nice. So you know there's like a lower bound and it's called zero, which is, yeah, I think a pretty reasonable lower bound as far as numbers go. Um, so um, now we need to kind of look at the other samplers that we, we described before that are kind of realistic. And we, we start with the uniform sampler. And we can calculate this uh, somewhat complicated term. And what we learned from this is essentially if, if we have an un uniform uh, signer distribution, um, then we get optimal anonymity fr uh, fr uh, from, from this uniform sampler, which is also kind of maybe not surprising. Um, but if we have a signer distribution that, uh, that is somewhat exponential, that values um, very new signers um, assigns very high probabilities to new signers, then it, this quickly goes very, very bad. And um, how bad can essentially be seen here. So we have agree, the uniform and optimal way line is up here. And once you add a few accounts to the system, so obviously as, as there are more accounts in the system, already like this probability drops, uh, the anonymity drops. and as we can see, like even for moderate numbers of like, say we have 1000 um, transactions in our system, uh, we are already at this line where there's less than one bit of anonymity left, even for relatively large ring sizes like 32. And um, for orientation, uh, realistically, we have something between 10 and 16 for systems like Monero. So this is, the setting in which we, we expect, expect to operate in a way. So then there's the mimicking sampler, and this is our formalization of what Monero is currently doing. And this is basically having an estimation of uh, signer probabilities and picking according to that uh, probability. And uh, we have here a very ugly divided by two in our anonymity term. And this is the best we could prove in closed form. But if we, uh, if we get a bit more concrete and look at um, concrete distributions and don't uh, restrict ourselves to closed forms, but just do some computation, um, this is the, the bound that we managed to prove. It's down here. The, the optimal is still here, the, uh, the uh, red line. And for all the settings with all the distributions, we are getting reasonably close to this optimal value. Um, so it's not perfect, but reasonably close. And that kind of supports the intuition that sampling according to the actual uh, expected distri uh, signer distribution is a moderately good strategy. Um, then there's our partitioning sampler. And here we restrict the um, assumed distribution to actually be flat for within one block. So as I said, like we, we explicitly choose this, uh, this uh, sampling strategy because we assume that within one uh, cryptocurrency block, uh, the probability that each of these possible signers that are included in that block uh, as outputs uh, are equally likely. And here we also get an optimal result. So, um, if we follow that um, strategy and our assumption is valid, then you get optimal anonymity. Uh, now, of course, this is 
kind of tricky and we see this already here on the right side here there are not enough um, signers to form another petition to, to, to add more rings to the system and so we have some cutoffs between the blocks where we have to mix things from an older and from a newer block and they are already the assumption is um, not super accurate in a way um, yes so Basically, there, there are two valid sampling strategies that we came up with. The one is, is mimicking sampling, um, which of course suffer, suffers heavily from the fact that you would need um, at least close estimate. Please know, but we don't, or I don't know how we could uh, even find such a distribution for an anonymous cryptocurrency. And we can, of course, uh, guess from, from non-anonymous systems, but that would just assume that people in anonymous and non-anonymous systems behave roughly the same, which is, a, <laughs> yeah, maybe it's a valid assumption, but uh, I'm not super convinced there. Um, but yes, um, yeah, then you get kind of perfect anonymity. And the alternative solution is uh, partitioning sampling. Uh, where we assume that all the information that you can have about potential signers is basically the, 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 the age, so the block when the signer first appears. And of course, this is all is, is maybe justifiable if you look at a, like a, if you observe the, uh, the blockchain, for example. Um, if you actually uh, run a mining pool, you will already have an order and time order between different transactions because you may receive one transaction before the other and you have way more fine-grained knowledge of uh, how old the transaction is. Um, and then those sites are not as good anymore, um, but it's still our preferred choice. Okay, and this is basically it. Um, as we already mentioned, uh, this uh, this paper will be presented at PETS in, I think, two weeks roughly. And yeah, we are, we're kind of still broadly interested in this area. So if you have any challenging, uh, open, uh, challenging questions on uh, how would you sample such a ring, uh, uh, feel free to ask. And yeah, I guess here we are. So thank you. We have a uh, uh, time for questions. Yeah. So a, a general question on this area. So you said you you kind of proved that Zcash is the perfect, like gives you the best security. So what what in your opinion are the reasons for why why not to do it the way Zcash does it? I mean, uh, this. Of course, we are also not, not doing like a full Zcash, right? So our assumption is that Zcash means everyone uses, I think, shielded pool transactions. I'm not super familiar there. Um, you can, of course, do, do, do Zcash in a way, right? Uh, I mean, this uh, Zcash involves a relatively, no, I mean, it, it involves a uh, zero knowledge proof over all accounts, right, that are still possible. And, there's clearly that there are efficiency considerations, especially if the system grows uh, associated with that. And um, yeah, I mean, yes. And we, we were also like, I mean, we were interested in also in the question of how would you select a, a subset for, for such a ring signature in an efficient manner. And, or, or yeah, for that. Yeah, maybe an maybe an interesting question is like, what if, the system really, if Zcash really explodes and they cannot put everything into a single Merkle tree anymore, it's like, what would be the smart way of doing it um, if that's not possible in a way? And then you would have much bigger ring sizes, I think, in the order of two to the 32 or something like that. Hmm. Yeah. So, 
Marcus, was that the end? Was there a question mark at the end? Uh, no, I think it's it's an open question. I guess I don't think right. it's it's like a, a what yeah what what about Zcash like as it really is in a way. This I guess your Zcash was a bit idealized. Yes. Right. Anyone else? So. Thank you, Christoph, again. I see that uh, Kirsten is online and uh, visible and with his camera turned on. Maybe you want to say some final words from the workshop organizers? Yeah, I mean, not, not wanting to take your stage here, but thank you. I'm audible, right? Yes. <laughs> thank you all for participating and for um, joining. Um, thank you for running the show. Thank you to the team in uh, Bern, who is running behind the scenes. Yeah. And certainly thank you to all the speakers and the submitters and the keynote speakers who have been uh, presenting. Um, this, is, uh, this was the 2021 edition. There will be a 2022 edition, hopefully in a person physical uh, location. We are, as on behalf of the steering committee, we are certainly looking for venues and volunteers so talk to us um the steering committee we have created a home for this workshop and we have a mailing list of 420 or so people interested in the theory and practice of blockchains uh who will be interested to join in person uh someday in this uh, event yes okay so thank you everyone for joining and thank you for claudio for running today and thank you everybody for making this an interesting event Yes. Thank you, everyone, and see you next year in person. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.